starting on this one. Uh, no, Here it's we okay. Go. Yeah. Okay, so good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the IALP, we would like to welcome uh, everyone for this uh, panel, which we hope will help uh, inspire people around the world and also have, uh, help shed some light on the challenges that face uh, the per individuals with disabilities and hopefully help promote awareness regarding this matter and how we can actually uh, help in order to support the persons with disabilities. Uh, and uh, I'm talking on behalf of the IALP. Uh, along with me is Dr. Ricky, uh, and uh, who will also help support us. And uh, can uh, we, first of all, we would like everyone to introduce themselves. I will just, uh, uh, well, we can start maybe alphabetically. So, uh, Elaine, if you would like to introduce yourself. He's pretty, pretty close to the beginning of the alphabet. And my name is Elaine or Ayala Matlo Talel. I live in Jerusalem. I am the founder and president of an organization called AV Israel for the rehabilitation of children born with deafness or with hearing loss uh, to help them learn spoken language and integrate into the hearing world. I myself um, have been wearing hearing aids for about um, 10 years for a moderate severe hearing loss and actually just very recently uh, found the cause of the hearing loss in our family, uh, which is a genetic um, mutation, is Wardenburg syndrome. I got into this business because I am the mother of twins who are today 32 years old, who were diagnosed with hearing loss, profound hearing loss at the age of two. And we looked for the way to give them a full and rich life and fell into, for all, for all kinds of circumstances, the auditory verbal approach to rehabilitation, to learn spoken language. And that's what we did. And we taught our daughters and bonded with other parents and professionals and created an organization, which today is a national organization that helps hundreds of children and families uh, learn spoken language, use cochlear implants, use the highest of technology to achieve the best of hearing. They are integrated in regular school systems. We have a lot of children, about 30% have other disabilities and we help them maximize their hearing potentials so they can focus on those other disabilities that they have to work with. And uh, we have advocated to change the perception and to increase awareness to what it means to be a hearing impaired deaf person today and what the needs of people with hearing loss from children through young adults, through uh, adults like me to uh, maximize life and to make it as rich and as fulfilling as possible. Okay, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, now, Mr. Kunt, can you please talk about yourself? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, I am Kunj. I am from uh, the western part of India. I have. I am currently practicing uh, as an SLP. I am running a rehabilitation center uh, started by us. Uh, basically, our focus, since I I have visual disability, I have a disease called as retinitis pigmentosa. So where uh, I face difficulties with dim light vision, where uh, whenever there is dim light, uh, irrespective of whether it is a day or night time, I face difficulty. I have uh, low, uh, field of vision is also low. So when walking on the road, if someone comes from the side, I might not notice. So the, these all difficulties I find so, when I started this uh, studying audiology and speech, that the thought was that if we can make a, a multi-speciality rehab setup in this part of the country, it would be really helpful for other people with other disabilities. So currently, we already have uh, our physiotherapy department working, our speech therapy department working, psychotherapy department working. So all these things uh, 
we we have established now our audiology setup is also ready so all set all things we want to cover in one uh, center basically i studied my uh, masters in slp from bangalore so it was it was a great experience because in my my city we did not we did not have any colleges where which, where i could study uh, audiology and speech so for 6 years i had to i had to stay outside and considering i cannot go out at night it was a, a big challenge but uh, somehow uh, with god's grace and uh, with uh, everyone's uh, push i stayed out for 6 years and i completed my masters degree and now i am working as i am the founder of the center so uh, this is how my life has been so far but i have i have just worked for 4 years in the field so i am relatively very young as compared to you all so i might not have so many experiences but yes this is my uh, brief story okay thank you very much coach for your wonderful introduction last but not least uh, dr tarek uh, gavar if you would like to talk about yourself and about okay. your journey okay assalamu uh, alaikum good evening everybody uh, my here in germany uh, my name is tarek mohammed jamf uh, i am 46 year, years old uh, i was born in egypt and i have lived in saudi arabia for many years Uh, my career as a doctor, uh, I have been working as a physician for 17 years now, six years in Egypt, and uh, others in uh, other uh, 11 years in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I work for almost 12 hours each day, uh, from Sunday to uh, Thursday every, every week. Uh, I am senior registrar in critical care at King Khalid University under uh, King Saudi University. Regarding this academic academic side, uh, I required a degree of medicine uh, in December 2000, a master degree of critical care in November 2009, and I have received membership of the Royal College of the Physicians of, of the Ireland in the December 2021. Uh, I, took, uh, I take advanced cardiac life support and basic life support course every uh, two weeks. Uh, I love my profession. To me, medicine is very respectful, is very respectful job. Uh, and it gives me a challenge uh, for the chance to heal the people. From the economic economic view, it also, also earns a uh, good money. Uh, as I like all parts of medicine, uh, it caused a big conflict for me, as if I was hesitant to a uh, choice which... Uh, Um, I, as I, I like all the parts of medicine, uh, it caused a big conflict for me uh, as a resident to choose which part of medicine, uh, but I chose uh, a critical care medicine. It provides me exciting. What can I, I, I use it in my clinical, critical care symptoms field? I have my ability to work exactly excellent, excellently under uh, pressures uh, alongside with the extraordinary team in the ICU. Uh, outside of the work, uh, the main hobbies are traveling, uh, reading, and uh, running as a sport. In my journey in hearing loss uh, regarding education, full work, and the personal life, I remember to have hearing loss in my left ear. Yeah. I remember to have hearing loss in my left ear, but it never really bothered me too, because I was still uh, able to hear from the right ear. Uh, however, it caused me some difficulties in certain situations. This led to me never getting my hearing loss investigated as a young adult. 
So the uh, TinaTops uh, was this a building and continuous beep that started as, uh, as soon as I opened my eyes in the morning and increased during the day until it became unbearable and prevented me from the film, feeling asleep at night. I actually, when I remember I have this TinaTops, I, I minded all people, all people have this uh, thing. All people hear this sound. Uh, not only me, just I have it. But, yeah, the, for for I mind this thing first. All 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 person all every person hearing this uh, town. Uh, the actual the, the important issue is lack of screening. But uh, but I have the most challenging situation. I have certain situation, especially on table discussion. Conversation were were difficult as uh, I wouldn't be able to hear what my friends had to say. Uh, also in cars, I struggled to communicate with both passenger and the driver, with the car driver. In shopping, I started uh, online shopping instead of the physically going to stores to avoid having discussion. In bank, I couldn't go to the bank or speak to anyone over the counter, as it was difficult to have conversation without hearing what uh, the others person had to say. In education, especially in the university, because of lack of accessibility in the university, I attended the medical, as I, as I attended as a medical student, I struggled to hear my lectures and the professor resorting to self-learning almost all of material and students. Different thing is, I, have, I had good uh, local ecologist who fitted me with uh, hearing aids. Over the years, the audiologist was always there to update the hearing aid. I had uh, regained hearing in lower frequencies, but minimal in the higher frequency. My hearing improved, but in class was still incapacitating. With hearing aid, I was able to work with some difficulty. My hearing loss was progressive and it continued to get worse. At most point, my hearing got more to the bad and my hearing aid essentially become useless. Uh, I was experiencing diminished quality of the life, even with the strongest sitting on my hearing aid. I was unable to adequately understand, understand speech. So the decision for the cochlear implant. Initially, I was concerned about the combining two types of hearing, my natural hearing uh, with the hearing aid in the right ear, and the electrical hearing with the cochlear implant in the left ear. After the surgery, I expected that the rehabilitation process would be easy, and, was, and actually I was wrong. The process was long and it took a lot of work, as it was learning as, it was a learning as the new language. I was forced to undergo the procedure again in the, in the, uh, with my right ear, as I suffered sudden hearing loss in March of 2018. This caused multitude of the problem. I started to miss her vision miss her, and, and, and had to take a break for, from my work. I was also forced to leave multiple organizations because of my trouble in hearing the conversation. After, after, uh, implanted, uh, after I had to implant, I have to implant, tinnitus has become mostly unnoticeable when I have my audio processing on, I can finally recognize voice and the speech <clears throat> and can practice listening with my implant. To have successful journey with your cochlear implant, you must have patience and enthusiasm. The boss is long and requires a lot of effort and support. And support. Accommodation my auditory disability. In work, uh, I started to using a ThinkLab digital stethoscope. This ThinkLab digital stethoscope addresses the specialized need and the unique challenge of hearing impaired medical professional. Because one effort and parallel amplification and the connectivity and the adaptivity. But the problem after I, I got this stethoscope, how I can connect it to the uh, cochlear implant. So I am using a uh, middle audio link. The audio link is a universal connectivity device that can be used to connect to my phone, tablet, and my stethoscope. 
I, this uh, big shards, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the one, this, this uh, you see, this is uh, a medial audio link, and this is a scope. I can practice medicine. Also, I'm using Arton uh, listening device. It can use the uh, Arton communication solution is one of the world leading manufacturers of assistive hearing technology. They connect using the Bluetooth, which is convenient. Also, I'm using uh, noise a cancellation Sony headphone. Uh, this uh, headphone uh, cover the cochlear process to block the outside distraction to help me focus on their audio. Can use it by using a uh, phone uh, and can, uh, can can use it as a phone and can hear phone and uh, uh, message and from the chat, from the colleagues. From what about the others from my experience for the other? How to improve the accessibility for those with hearing difficulty, especially in the education sector? The important is early and regular screening. And actually, what is happening in Saudi Arabia nowadays, they are doing early screening for the babies. Uh, every baby, uh, they are doing uh, regular uh, screening for him to, uh, to see expectation of any difficulty or in hearing to, to uh, solve this problem. So the important for early and regular screening. For the, for the adult who is hearing the uh, problem uh, and attending the university, it's important to, uh, for recording the lessons and the lectures. Uh, and it is important for the teachers and the professors to uh, be attention and to be care uh, if they notice any uh, student has a difficulty. Also, it's important to a smaller class size and uh, normalize asking for help. It's important. In closing, I would like to take a chance to show my appreciation to all my professors who helped me in this journey. Uh, I'm very grateful to my family and friends because without their uh, unconditional help and the support, none of this would be in possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tarek. You not, did not only introduce yourself, you spoke to us about your journey, uh, an educational journey and also in your work and your hearing journey. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, now, uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Kunj? I know Dr. Tarek spoke about uh, some of the challenges that he faced in work and education. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and how he overcame them. Uh, can you, for you, which were the most uh, challenging situations for you? And the challenges that you really had to work in order to overcome. Okay, fine. So if I start, uh, I, I'll start from the beginning because see first biggest challenge was going out of town to study mm -hmm. because I have spent, spent my whole life with my family where if I want anything, if I want to go anywhere, they are with me. But first biggest challenge was going out of the town to study and that too a place where nobody uh, of our relatives or friends, nobody used to live. So that was the biggest challenge. Then second thing uh, is again, traveling. If I travel, so I basically studied in two institutes. First, when I did my undergraduate was, uh, was in uh, like around two, three hours journey from my hometown. And next, when I did my post graduation was, it was, uh, quite far. So if I go by flight also, it takes me three hours to reach. So the, the, the post-graduation one was difficult. So traveling is one more thing. No, nobody used to travel with me. So I have to travel on my own. I have to uh, manage things I own, whether, whether I'm going by bus or train or by flight. So that was again another challenge. Third thing would come to accommodation. So if mm -hmm. I'm if I'm staying in a uh, uh, rented house or if I'm staying in a hostel, that is the biggest challenge because what happens is I don't get the lighting which I want when it comes to a hostel or it comes to a rented house. Still, if if I rent a house, it is possible that I might be able to change uh, lightings according to me. I I can tell the owners to you know help me out with that. 
but in hostel situation it becomes very difficult because everything is uh, handled by the institution so again i stayed in hostel also i also also i have i have experienced both of them both of the situations so uh, that is uh, another issue because finding an accommodation then staying there either alone or with someone but if i am alone then it becomes uh, challenging to manage everything then from the accommodation if i have to travel to the institute let's say if i am staying in the hostel and i have to travel to the institute maybe it is 500 meters away but still you don't know when it rains when it is uh, dark when you uh, when you are uh, free from the college it becomes uh, dark in winters so going back to the residence or the the hostel anywhere that becomes uh, another challenge so this was outside the college now if i talk about inside the college uh, when in audiology setup we generally i have seen in india is like we have one lamp on the ceiling and that is it that is it so that that is really less light for me if i want to read or write something there that light is very less for me so uh, first thing from outside if there is uh, bright sunlight and if i have to go inside the audio audiology setup the adaptation process takes me long like the day like so if i am in the bright light and now i am coming to the dark the, the adaptation is takes very long so first the lights are dim and second thing adaptation takes long so it becomes really difficult to you know if someone uh, tells go in and uh, call someone so i can't go in and call someone because i can't find that person so that is uh, challenging then again uh, doing the testing uh becomes difficult you know at times patient uh, does not respond or if there is a child there is a child whom we have to see the behavioral responses so okay. I, i i cannot i cannot see those behavioral responses eye blinks and all because the child is sitting uh on the other room and i have to see from far whether he is giving any response or not or whether uh parents are uh, even parents are cueing them or not i don't know so that becomes difficult now uh, when it comes to classrooms uh, we nowadays since i studied uh, just like in past 10 years so we had a uh, few digital things and also we had projectors we had uh, we had computers we had phones everything so uh, when it comes to teaching if i am sitting somewhere behind i cannot read what is there on the board i cannot read what is there on the slides so that becomes because when we have our clinical conferences and journal clubs and all so at that time it becomes really difficult to you know figure out what is written on the slide but i have to sit because uh, that is how it is meant to be and i cannot go on the stage and see what is written there so uh, that is what happens now uh, one more challenge happens in library when i have to find some books there are so many books in the libraries but i have to read each book and find you don't know how much lighting would it be would be there on the book or anything so so there is uh, there is difficulty fair amount of difficulty in finding the books because at times uh, at the top there is written that till this to this year the journals are kept here but i cannot read what is written there so again i have to see what all journals are written so uh, that is in library and uh, yes and last in exam halls in uh, see whenever we have our exams that is an uh, another institution so it is not like we study in this one institution and we have our exams there only so we have our exams in other institution so every time i have to go to the other institution before the exams and meet someone that i have this and this issue i need to sit near a window i cannot sit in the dark i need to sit near a window so you please prepare for that so every before every exam i have to go there and i have to explain them my situation so these all basic challenges i faced during my uh, studies this is this is what i faced and did technology help you and do you, or and do you suggest other technological advancements that may support people 
uh, such as yourself when facing these challenges? Uh, actually, yes, technology helped me a lot because see, uh, if I tell that uh, I have to travel to, let's say XYZ place for uh, buying something or whatever. So if I have to take a bus and go, then I have to read what is written on the bus, where the bus is going. But since now we have our all our rental cabs and all on the phone, I can just put the address and I can just uh, just see that the cab guy will come and I can go. So that way it helped. Again, in library and all, I use my phone to take a picture or maybe zoom it, the text and read what is written. So in every point of time, the technology actually was the main reason why I could do this. I can use my flashlights if I need uh, some, I need to read and the, it is dark. So every time there is uh, the, the, this, these small, small technologies, which might not mean anything to others, but these things actually meant a lot for me. So yes, technology played a big role. Okay. And uh, I want uh, to ask Aileen. Yeah, sure. Come on. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, yeah, I want to ask. Regarding that her uh, twins, uh, yes. what were the challenges when they were young and what happened now today with them? Now you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Um, I think it's a perfect bridge from what Kunt just talked about because he spoke about self-advocacy, how you have mm -hmm. to go and go after what you need in order to be able to succeed. You have to use your phone. You have to have, make sure there's light. You have to sit by the window. You have mm -hmm. to do all those things. And I, as a parent, realized that I had to be an advocate for my children because they mm -hmm. didn't even know what they needed or what they wanted or where they were going or that even they were hearing impaired, they didn't even know they were deaf. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very interesting transition to think about the role of parents because when we got into this, I, have no, I had no connection with hearing loss or I only saw hearing aids on my grandmother at the age of 93. I had no knowledge of this entire world of what it is to be hearing impaired. So it was a whole education to me and I have to say that when first the girls were diagnosed uh, 30 years ago, the sense was they were not going to be like their sisters, their older sisters. They would have to learn in special educational programs. They would not have the same kind of lives. They would not be mainstreamed. They would not be able to have the choices that their older sisters would have. Um, and something in me and in all the support system that I have of my family uh, taught me that that is just not so. And we learned along the way, thanks to technology, the cochlear implants, and thanks to the advancements in research and understanding of how the brain works, that kids with hearing loss, with profound deafness, with the right technologies, could learn to speak normally and go to school in a regular school and live in their communities with their families in their culture, in their language. It was a revolution at the time because we were told otherwise. So the idea of having to um, learn how to manipulate or, or negotiate, not manipulate, negotiate the system when we wanted to send our children to a regular preschool and not to the established program for children with hearing loss, uh, uh, it was not easy. People frowned upon it. They thought we were being negligent parents. They thought we were taking away opportunities from our kids when actually we felt we were giving them the best opportunity. Mm -hmm. If they could hear, we were one of the first families whose children had cochlear implants in 1993. So we went to New York and had cochlear implants there and came back and the girls started hearing and we had to train our own speech therapists in, in auditory verbal therapy. We sent a speech therapist to Canada where I'm from. We brought professionals over here who are auditory verbal people to help the girls themselves and to teach other people along the way, other interested professionals. We really came in at a time that was a revolution. When we sent our children to preschool, we had to put up I remember putting up egg cartons on the, the ceiling to make it acoustically accessible mm. because it wasn't in the system, the responsibility of the school system 
to make sure that kids could hear, these kids could hear in the classroom because in truth around that time, most of the classes for children with hearing loss were actually placed on highways because kids couldn't hear anyway, so let's put them beside a noisy place. When in fact, children with hearing loss need the quietest place to be able to study. So that whole switch, that idea that you had to make sure the conditions in the classroom were accessible. We always told the teachers that the girls that were in speech therapy and auditory verbal speech therapy, that they were in a regular school for a reason. Not so the teachers would do all of that extra teaching of what the language that they had missed. They started late. They were three when they started hearing, really, even though they had hearing aids the year before. It wasn't enough. Just mm -hmm. similar to what Tariq was talking about, his own loss. You can have hearing aids, but mm -hmm. if they don't do anything for you, you need to go further. And we were lucky mm -hmm. that there was somewhere to go. We were lucky that there were cochlear implants on the highway. We were lucky that we could do that. But even this idea of um, sending the kids to school, regular school, so that they could learn from normatively speaking children behavior and we could all understand what the level where we want to go that was one of the big questions how do we see our kids in five years where do we want them to be and if you want them to be learning having full language having a community living within the family then the big question is so how are you going to get there and we're not going to get there by depriving them of being exposed and living in the hearing world so we had to really make the conditions possible for them to be able to do that. They had extra services. They had um, services. We had to fight for them because at the time it was not customary that you would send a teacher to the educational program. They would have to come to a special center that dealt with hearing impaired children. And we said, no, they're busy after school. After school, they're going to youth groups. They're taking music lessons. They're playing with their friends. We want this in the day, in the school, in the sessions particularly that were language-based, that were demanding. And we brought our own people in, then finally we got the Ministry of Education to approve to bring somebody in. But it was always a struggle to advocate, advocating for the children. And now at the end of the day, uh, Ricky asks, so what happened with my children? So they finished regular high school with full matriculation. They did what all Israeli young people do, they did their volunteer service as teachers and photographers in the army. And then they went off to do what all kids do. They go away for a month, or a year and travel and see the world. And then they came back and they each did an undergraduate degree. One, mm -hmm. at, one at the arts college, a famous art college in Jerusalem. She's an artist. And today has actually completed her special education diploma as a special ed teacher and as a teacher in Tel Aviv for kids on the autistic spectrum. And her sister came back from her travels and worked in a cow shed for a year, milking cows. But then she went to college and she um, graduated in photography. And she's a professional photographer today and is doing a master's in film. And these two girls are like the spearheads of the new generation of what it means to be deaf today. And I think it's, this is a wonderful forum to be able to get that message out. Deafness mm -hmm. is not what it was at all. And these kids are very confusing because you talk to them and they're amazing. Their language is great. Like I've told you, they've gone to college, they have friends, they have full lives, and yet they have needs. They need services. And the system is still geared to that kind of old school kind of deafness and giving the services that the old school needs. But these young people who I just met a group of them yesterday, who are graduates of the auditory verbal program that I ran, um, they need services because they look like everybody else, and yet it takes them longer to do things. They still have difficulties in noisy situations. They need to be able to have the technology, be able to hear well. They need to have the system understand that just because you look like everybody else, deafness is that invisible uh, disab disability. Nobody sees it, mm -hmm. so it can't be anything. And when you hear these kids talking, then you say, wow, there's nothing wrong with them. But these young people are heroes and they struggle every day to live in the, in, a, in the hearing world and to succeed in the hearing world and to great, get great satisfaction and pleasure. But it's a struggle. And I think that this is part of what this kind of a forum to help people understand that we are at a point in a revolution in the rehabilitation mm -hmm. of children with hearing loss.
and there's still one to be done. Yeah, thank you very much. Very inspiring. We, uh, we really, I think everyone who heard your words appreciates your efforts as a mother and also as someone who actually uh, defended the rights of the hearing impaired. And this is quite honorable. Uh, now, going back to Tarek, I know you spoke, not maybe not now, but initially you weren't identified early enough. So if you go back and you do get identified, it's like you get early identification, what would your uh, recommendations be for schools for, for people with hearing impairment? Uh, you're muted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, uh, nowadays, this technology is available. And uh, with technology, with everything will be uh, easy. Uh, I, I'm using technology, updated technology for hearing. And for the people with a cochlear implant, it's important to use the, the, all the new technology to uh, update uh, their hearing and to be uh, on, 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 to, to be uh, in good direct uh, this for communication. So uh, with the implant, we need technology to use the technology. Okay, so you would support that the educational system would provide supporting technology so you can be integrated in regular education. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, Kunj, uh, I think you heard what Elaine was talking about, about the integration, the importance of integration in the educational mm -hmm. system and how she had to fight for it. Uh, for you, uh, would you have also any recommendations for people about self-advocacy and also about what you would like, what you would like um, uh, for others in your situation to have so support them in the educational system? Do you have any recommendations you think these are vital for you? Okay. Uh, um... The basic thing, actually, what I would want is uh, basic uh, awareness in schools, uh, like among teachers, mm -hmm. that how how they can deal with this these situations. Because what happens is, uh, throughout my educational years, there were people who supported me, even teachers. But the issue was, initially everything we had to explain them we had to demonstrate them we had to make sure they understood and then they would they used to stop support but otherwise mm -hmm. there are there are situations where they would say mm -hmm. okay no he cannot study in this school they they have to go to the blind mm -hmm. school because they cannot study they they will not be able to sit with uh, normal children mm -hmm. so uh, so basic understanding of uh, I, I would say uh, I would in, include everything, visual impairments, hearing impairments, uh, other disabilities. Mm -hmm. Since we, we deal with all of them, I know that the, the kids who are not even, you know, uh, who are not at all suited for uh, special schools, uh, normal schools say that they, they will not take them, they have to go to special schools. So basic understanding how they can manage them in school, if they have it would be great for all the people, for all the kids, because uh, they have all the potential. It is just mm -hmm. that they need right, right person to take care of them. Okay, so you think awareness. Yes. Where raising awareness is really important. Yes. And for them, so even with like hearing impairment or visual impairment, that we should raise awareness as professionals among uh, the educational society, uh, the education uh, educa uh, teachers, and also among the society. And I think that's really important. Uh, and uh, what I loved about all the presentations, and I think all the presentations, everyone that spoke today, uh, that we have to raise expectations on what to expect from an individual with a disability. I think this is very important. And I think Elaine had to fight to prove it. And Dr. Tariq had to fight to prove it as well in his workplace and in education along, the, uh, along his career where he had to prove that he is. He is just as, uh, as uh, um, 
qualified as someone without an impairment. And I think this is very important point as well. Uh, they, we our society have to include everyone, regardless of the disability, and we should have high expectations for everyone. And this would help in order for to support them. Uh, so this is what I get from everyone. And um, now, uh, Elaine spoke. You spoke about the career that your children took. Did they have any specific reason why they chose that career or, or not? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Both of them chose careers that are not. Um, I remember when we began, our first therapist said, they're not going to be history professors. They did not take language-based um, professions. Uh, we as a family are very art-oriented ourselves. None of us are doctors or lawyers, so um, not in my nuclear family. So the fact that they chose art and and film was I'm not to be expected, but I was so happy that they had that love. And that's something that I always tell parents. These children who are facing a disability, you have to help them find what makes them feel great and encourage that and nourish it and nurture it. And I guess um, that is a message that they got and that's what they that's what they love. I found out many years later that Donna, who was the photographer, she saved all of the tickets to the movies that she saw as a child. Mm -hmm. From such a young photography, and that is what she's chosen to do so beautifully with her life. So she has a passion and it's so important because their language skills between us are excellent, but they're not academically oriented. College was not easy, oops, here we go. Seminar writing, that's not their forte and they needed help and they got some services and we fought for services and we got them help, but they have found that passion that makes them wake up in the morning and love what they do. And the fact that Tamar went back to school to be a teacher for special education was to me an indication that she recognized how important it is to support children who have special needs. And she comes to it as a, in a different way. Imagine those kids in the class who have her with her hearing loss. It makes me, with the, I'm here with today. What mm -hmm. wonderful models they are for inclusion and for the possibilities that anybody can do anything that they want if you put your mind to it. And I see mm -hmm. that, that the way the children and the parents respond to having a teacher like this. I mean, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. She continues with her art, but her passion really is to uh -huh. help with deafness, mm -hmm. with autism, to give them everything mm -hmm. that they need. And it comes from her own passion. So um, it's no wonder they chose what they did to your question. It just, uh -huh. something, it's a burning fire inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so Dr. Tarek, I know you also talk about how you loved medicine, and uh, so, uh, but you're muted, by the way. So, what initially made you choose medicine? Is there any specific reason, despite the uh, uh, difficulties that you were facing? Uh, actual difficulties in medicine it depends on the, the branch of medicine. Uh, I, I, I recommend it, uh, advice uh, for the people with hearing aid, uh, like medicine, to show us uh, the branch, branch of medicine not dealing with the patient, like radiology, like uh, laboratory. It is better to uh, not to struggle with the patient because actually uh, there is difficulty uh, to communicate with the patient with hearing problem. It is important to understand the patient and the communicating way. So, it's important to, uh, with hearing a problem, I uh, advise to uh, with the doctor with hearing a problem to show us a uh, branch of doing with the patient, as I said, as a uh, radiological laboratory. Not to, to be that contact with the patient. Yeah, but actually, as someone who has for worked with product, and I know, I know you worked on having the, uh, that we, um, uh, because I know we work together on having the technologies that help support you 
in order for you uh, to hear on the telephone and also to use the stethoscope. So, uh, I, I, as, my, as, my, as yeah. I present my presentation, yeah. I didn't discover I had a problem until I become intense. Before this, I, uh, I didn't mind that I have hearing the problem. Uh, after hearing, uh, after I heard I have hearing problem, I solved this problem. As I said, with technology, uh, I can use this scope. I can use yeah. uh, with the, with the, with the, I, 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 by technology. I solved my problem. But mm -hmm. I am talking about the one who know he has problem before to start to practice with it. If you for this people or for this physician, if he will practice medicine, I, 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 I said to uh, choice branch not dealing with the vision. Because I, I, I discovered the later, yeah, I discovered after discover after I start to start to practice medicine, I discovered I have a heavy problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know one of the consequences of not having hearing loss discovered early, maybe that you, you had more struggles than others. But in reality, even if you don't think it, I think your story is really inspiring because despite of the hearing loss and despite of the challenges, you actually continued and persevered and had a career just like someone with a normal hear with normal hearing. And I think that's a really important message that it, you, it doesn't hinder you from going on and pursuing. And I think you're actually an excellent example for someone who persevered despite having the difficulties, the tinnitus which you thought everyone had and you didn't realize it was a specific problem because you had a hearing loss. So in reality, I think that that is inspiring for others who have identified the problem because even someone who hasn't identified the problem, they can actually make it. Uh, so back to you, Kunj. And uh, when you chose your career, you, I'm sure you were all driven by passion. This is the general story here. And so was there anything, any moment that told you, okay, this is the career I really have to pursue? and at this time, would you would you think about changing your career, or you think you have done the right choice? Okay, uh, actually, when uh, when uh, we were uh, thinking that uh, what career I should pursue, so first thing was that we wanted to find something where I could want work independently, like uh, I did not have to rely on someone. That was one <laughs> consideration because what happens is if I am uh, doing a job somewhere, it might be possible that I have to do things according to their expectations. So first consideration was I, the, I have to choose, to choose a field where I can do things on my own. So that was first consideration. Uh, second thing, since uh, 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 more a, te a technical side of engineering side uh, of work it was not possible for me, so I had to find a paramedical uh, branch. So there, 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 this thing came up that, okay, this, this uh, field is an emerging field. There, the thought was not only to find out a, a profession where, you know, I can do my work, but uh, the one more thought was that the profession should be, should have future scopes where we can work. So there this field comes up now when i joined college i was not so much aware about this particular thing i had the idea that these particular things are there but when i started studying i did my four years of uh, undergraduate then two years of uh, my uh, postgraduate then i started realizing okay so this is in like all the different rehab professionals face these so many kinds of problems, have so many kinds of uh, issues, people coming with so many issues. So this, then the passion started coming. Actually, the passion was not there when I joined the, uh, joined the college. So this is when the passion started coming. So there was no consideration where, uh, okay, uh, I have to study anyhow. So what should I do? There was, it was not that. It was that I want to study, but I, I chose a field which I could handle with where I could work. 
and it might not create a problem even if i lose my vision since it is a uh, progressive issue so even mm -hmm. if i lose my vision it might not be a problem that was that was uh, the basic understanding when i joined there was nothing where i would say that uh, this this particular field is i want because i can hide my uh, issues and i can work so uh, not totally driven by passion but then yes it, the passion started coming as i uh, learned more and more mm -hmm. so it was more practical plus passion for yes. you yes yes it's more of a oh, of a balance between both yes. of them yes. but you have because, to love what you do obviously yes yes ma'am because uh, what happened is uh, in in uh, i would just add this point because there was never a point where we thought that this is not possible you cannot do this that's why you do this it was just that whatever is possible for you you do so it is not that okay this is not possible don't do this uh, when i was traveling for my uh, my uh, post graduation also it is really really difficult for going from uh, gujarat my state to karnataka which is two different languages i cannot understand that language but still i went there the food is different the place is different the culture is different and staying there so there was never a thought that this is not possible so while choosing the career also it was not that this is not possible mm -hmm. but we just chose that okay this can be a good profession mm -hmm. so this is how okay. we went about yes yeah so i do i do agree with you i think we sh uh, we probably when we are thinking about careers for individuals with disabilities we really shouldn't limit their possibilities but uh, and we they we should consider their passions what they love to do and also if they want to have think about practical ideas and things like that that would be great but i think that's the that's the important message from everyone here that it shouldn't stop you from pursuing any career you want. If you want to become a physician, go become a physician. If you want to become a speech language pathologist, go ahead, be a speech language pathologist. If you want to become an artist, that's great. A teacher, a teacher for the autistic children, that would be also great. So everything is an option for them and I, I, for everyone. And this is, I think, a key message that we want that everyone. That is the limit. Yes, the sky is the limit. We really have to, we really have to highlight that. And you, you do inspire, I think, everyone who listens to you about the sky being the limit for everyone, pretty much, regardless of whether they have a disability or not. And um, now uh, I will go back, so I wouldn't get, I hope I don't forget anyone. So Elaine, if you have like, let's say, key points that you really, really have to highlight about what is necessary for individuals with disabilities so they can integrate into society. What do you think are key points? Uh, you're muted, Elaine. Yeah, I'm mute. Uh, Elaine, yeah, please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, great. I think some of the points already came up today, this idea of being able to advocate and to have an environment that is attentive, attentive to, we have to, we have to uh, change perceptions and we have to make it possible for people to get the needs that they, what the services they need, the technology they need, the replacement technology in time, it's moving so fast. Things are happening so quickly and we have to be able to help these young people and anybody with disabilities keep up because otherwise we're dooming them to a marginalized life. And that's not in anyone's interest. I want to raise an issue that didn't come up here, which is so interesting. The beautiful thing about all of the people here today and people, my, and my children as well, they're independent, creative, tax-paying citizens of their mm -hmm. society. And they're not a burden on the society, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that society doesn't owe them something. It's very easy to fall back, it's not easy, but people in, in deafness in any event, they say um, the statistics are very high on an underemployment rate of people with hearing loss, that they work in jobs that they don't really, they don't really use their, their potential skills. They've never developed the skills. And so they're stuck in a way making 
marginal, minimal salaries, if working at all. We don't want that. We don't want a society like that. You spoke about Shazi, you spoke about inclusion. We want everyone to be able to do what they want to do with respect. And mm -hmm. it's not, no one is doing anyone a favor. It's their right as individuals mm -hmm. of a society. So we have to make that possible. That for me is the most mm -hmm. important thing that society understands that, that inclusion is a responsibility and society in order to get the most out of these people, the most of our children, the most out of any professional person with a disability, it's society's obligation to help that happen. And it's good for society at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dr. Tarek, do you have specific points that you really think are very important for everyone uh, to highlight? So uh, individuals such as yourself are integrated into society and things that you would like to happen everywhere around the world. Uh, Dr. Tariq, you're also muted. If you can please unmute yourself. What would you, what are the main points that would like to happen? Mm. Yes. Yeah, as I said in my presentation, the important is, is early screening. It's important for uh, to, to detection of the problem is early screening. Uh, and the early detection for uh, to, uh, to 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 know the problem early, and if we mm -hmm. know the problem early, it will be the, the solution. It will be easier. easier. Mm -hmm. uh, as 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 to what we're uh, doing now in Saudi Arabia, they are doing early screening for all uh, babies. It's important if you detect the problem early, it will be uh, easier to manage. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important to to detect it early. Mm -hmm. So early, mm -hmm. early detection and early intervention programs yes, are very important. And what about awareness? Raising Both. awareness. Awareness of uh, the issues and how to deal with them, let's say in the educational system and in the workplace. Uh, as, I, as I said, then the education is important for, for, the, for the education. Uh, mm -hmm. early, early detected can, if by, by teachers and the professors, they can catch uh, this problem with the student. If they catch it earlier, it would be managed easier. Yeah, so they would be aware of the problem and how to deal with it. Yes, so right. this was an issue that you think that should be, that's important and should be dealt with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything else you would like to add? Uh, it's important for me, for me, it's early screening. And early screening and uh, uh, early screening is important. Because okay. I, my problem actually, because I'm not early detected for my problem and the screening. Mm -hmm. For myself, the late detection and the late screening, this, this is the, the problem. So the, to solve this problem for the others, is early detection and the backup is a, is a problem early. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your insight. And uh, I still think you are inspiring, Dr. Tarek, because regard, even though you had late identification, late detection, and you didn't get the early intervention that you required, you actually persevered and you have accomplished a lot. So we really appreciate your, um, your efforts and for your contribution today in showing this, the, the sharing your experience with the others. Now, Kunj, uh, I know you also spoke about the educational system and how much awareness that needs to be done as well in the educational system and in society. And uh, so what about, I have to point out, what about early detection? Do you think for you, did you were, was your problem detected at an early enough stage? And would you have anything else to remark regarding early intervention and early detection for you, for your, hear, for your visual impairment? Okay, uh, actually uh, my uh, visual impairment was uh, detected very much like very quickly, I would say. I was not even few months old 
at that time my visual impairment was detected as i have an elder sister who has the same issue and uh, mm -hmm. she was she was diagnosed uh, after 8 9 months and uh, actually my father himself is a, a doctor so uh, mm -hmm. he found something suspicious that okay there is something wrong here so they got tested for her and then when it uh, when i was born it was expected that it might be possible so better to check and uh, when they checked it they found that this issue was there but uh, mm -hmm. for for uh, the thing which i have uh, we don't have a treatment as such as of now mm -hmm. there is no treatment so it is progressive it might be possible that it doesn't progress it is possible that it can progress you don't know it depends uh, on the individual so there is no treatment as such so early identification for treatment there is no no issues because treatment will not be possible even if you are identified early but when it comes to your education the early identification is very important because if you know before the education has started you can keep telling your schools your uh, your uh, all teachers that these issues this kid will face so they are aware of it and they tackle it accordingly otherwise what happens is child goes to the school teacher says this child does not uh, uh, like to study he he keeps uh, playing or he he keeps running around he doesn't like to uh, play so you put him in another school so this is what would happen if this particular thing is not uh, identified early so education wise yes it should be identified pretty much early but treatment wise there is no scope as of now so i don't know what would happen in future okay so what are the main points you would like to point out or highlight if we if someone asks you what are the main points that are important in order for integration uh, to happen within society okay so uh, actually first point i would say is uh, self awareness because uh, if the person himself is aware about his condition and his uh, abilities then it would help him a lot so first thing i would say is self awareness second thing i would say you do do not look at your uh, condition you just focus on what you want to do you would do it anyhow so mm -hmm. the, how we spoke that sky is the limit mm -hmm. yes. you don't look at the limits you just go ahead and keep doing yourself your things mm -hmm. uh, uh then next point i would say is uh, uh, uh since we have we are here for uh, understanding what what improvements we can bring in educational setting so i would say uh i had throughout my journey i had our professors who helped us helped me a lot uh, we one of them we have here with us professor ranga sai uh, he was someone whom you know i could go and i could sit there, sit with him for hours and he would he would try to understand what difficulties i face in this institute mm -hmm. so 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 these kind of people are there in the institutions so the the person with uh, any kind of uh, disability needs to find that person who who can support him it is not that others are do not want to support but this particular person tries to understand and tries to bring in the changes so so maybe you can find someone who actually tries to help you whether irrespective of your condition so what happens is in that case uh you you can you, you don't have to burden have a, any burden that what will i do how will i do this i don't know anyone you just go and you share that these issues are there i can uh, what can i do so that person will help you out or even uh, they can talk to the institute that this issues this person is facing because at times all the uh, professors are not so approachable that you go and you just easily tell them so self awareness about the disability then uh, not looking at the 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 outcome not not looking at how how difficult the road is but just going ahead and third thing yes you throughout your journey you find someone who is there to help you so if these things are there so i think every 
person with disability will will achieve whatever he wants to achieve okay anyone would like to add anything extra i think it was the inspiring panel and very <laughs> very interesting and important and thank you everybody for participating and tell your story it's yeah. very very important so it yeah it was very interesting and we really appreciate all your stories and all your experiences thank you ricky for your support for this panel yeah. and yeah to sum it up so basically to sum it up uh, we had uh, issues that were raised were the importance of self self awareness, the importance of raising awareness in society as well, and the importance of self advocacy, and even it includes parents advocacy, and the importance of pursuing what uh, what you want if you whether you have a disability or not, and not putting limit on the uh, a limit that is uh, associated with disability. And I think this is a very important point. I, the sky is the limit for all of you and for all of your children and for everyone actually, whether they have a disability or not. And an important scientific point was pointed out by Dr. Tariq as a physician, and I appreciate it, which is very important, which is early detection which would help in early intervention and would also help with awareness when dealing with that individual. So, and uh, I, so these some of the key points and couldn't raise also a point where you have to have some support within society in order for you to continue and don't be embarrassed to ask for help when needed. And this is not, this does not mean weakness. This is more, you are, act, this is, let's consider it self-advocacy rather than weakness. And, but you, uh, the society should support these individuals. And I hope everyone gets the support and the means, the science, technological means for them to pursue whatever they want to pursue regardless of their disability. So thank you very much for a very inspiring panel. And I hope it leaves a positive note on everyone who listens to this panel. And I just someone said, ah, yes, of course you can. I just wanna say one thing that here we are on Zoom, sitting all around the world, talking and sharing a subject that we all share, which is incredible. And that we all agree on the, what has to be done. And I think this is the beginning of the change, that it's a world thing. The world has to wake up to see these people as see our children and see all the people here as individuals who are worthy and deserve whatever support is necessary for them to become the best that they can be. And this is a universal message for everybody. So thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this. This was re really inspiring to me sitting here in Jerusalem, knowing that I'm speaking to countries that are far away from me. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having uh, me also here because I am. I got a chance to uh, talk with so many of you who are from different parts of the world. So that is a great thing for me because generally we know people around, but uh, so many people from different parts of the world face different difficulties. So it is a, a great thing uh, to know about each of them yeah thank you thank you very much okay, yes. thank you thank you so much thank you thank you have a look bye-bye bye bye bye-bye bye. Bye. okay